Hello, I am C.A. Brill, the author of Why Christians Should Oppose Christian Nationalism, a book about biblical reasons why Christians should oppose Christian nationalism. Now, last time we talked a bit about the use of the sword, and this time we're going to talk a bit about the abuse of the sword. But before we get into that, let me just tell you a couple of things. First of all, if you are interested in the book, it is available in the description. If you have any questions about anything I'm saying or follow-up questions, then feel free to leave questions in the comment section below. And at the end of the series, I will be answering those questions. Additionally, if you would be interested to keep up with future episodes, feel free to subscribe. If you want to expand the conversation so that more people are able to engage with these arguments, whether for or against, then do like and share on social media. So anyway, with all that being said, let's get right into the topic at hand. So, the abuse of the sword is especially grievous when it is done by those who do so to ostensibly champion piety against faithful Christians, as occurred early in Christian history. And we see this in John 8, 31 through 59. So let's just uh, get there. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house for ever, but the son abideth for ever. If a son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father, Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, which do ye not? Why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words; ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honour my father, and ye do dishonour me. And I seek not mine own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honour myself, my honour is nothing. It is my Father that honoureth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him, and if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. 
but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So, in this passage, we read about uh, various Jews here that are uh, in conversation with Jesus, and they consider themselves to be faithful people. They consider themselves to be the heirs of Abraham, but Jesus points out that they're actually behaving in an unrighteous manner, and that uh, in this case, they're even going so far as rejecting the Messiah that Abraham looked forward to. So therefore, there are some ostensibly uh, faithful men here who ultimately are rejecting that to which they ought to be faithful and even are going so far as contemplating violence against the Son of God himself. But... Uh, to further get into my point that I'm trying to make, I'll also go to John 16, 2 through 3. They shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. So you're here once again, uh, this isn't talking specifically about something that's happening to Jesus, but now uh, we see a discussion relating to the disciples, that uh, their uh, fellow Jews will kick them out of the synagogues, and that they will even think that killing them, killing the disciples, is something pious to do. And the reason for that is, is because they do not know the Father. So these are people who ostensibly are faithful, uh, who are contemplating killing uh, the uh, disciples and, and the apostles, but they are not faithful ultimately, as is uh, demonstrated by their cruelty to those who are actually faithful. And another passage, Acts 9, 1 through 31. And Saul, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why, perse why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And have seen 
in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he have done to my saints, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, have sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this, on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying in wait in a wait was known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So this is, of course, the story of Saul's conversion. And one amazing thing here, of course, is that the reason why they were persecuting the Christians is because they thought that it was pious to do so. So what is the point here in me talking about uh, all these instances uh, in the New Testament when early Christians were being persecuted well, it has to do with the fact that such persecution ultimately leads to some bad things. What bad things, namely? Well, obviously, it leads to the persecution of faithful Christians and the attacking of those that actually ought to be uh, protected and defended by the faithful which uh, leads to uh, various problems. So I think it is a huge error, in my opinion, to attack people for differences in doctrine. And when I say attack, I mean attack with a sword, that is with violence. That does not mean that I don't think that differences in doctrine uh, ought not to be disputed. I think that they certainly uh, should be disputed uh, in an honorable way. However, I do not believe that in the context of a church, there has been the sword given in order to uh, deal with such affairs. And I think it is even worse in the case when 
faithful Christians themselves are being persecuted for adhering to the truth. And this is not something that just occurred early in church in, in Christian history, uh, that, that this persecution has been repeated by various polities for various causes. So, depending on which denomination you're part of, there are examples that can certainly be given. As if, if you're... Uh, even if you're Catholic or if you're Evangelical, if you're a Baptist, if you're a Lutheran, if you're a Presbyterian, if you're uh, Orthodox, any grouping that calls itself Christian has examples in its own history of being persecuted by another grouping that calls itself Christian and, and therefore being persecuted in the name of Christ, for having uh, doing things ostensibly uh, by their conscience in the name of Christ. So, I think that this is possibly a huge uh, potential issue that could emerge in some cases, uh, especially when we begin to talk about implementing uh, particular theological views politically. And what do I mean by this? Well, uh, therefore, Christians should be careful when implementing a particular vision for righteous government so that they do not demand other Christians to do more than what God has commanded them. So we're going to look at Deuteronomy 4.2. I've gone over this verse a few times in this series. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So there are some things that God has commanded, and there are some things that God has not commanded. Now, this is, of course, in the context of the Old Testament law. So, there's different ways in which people interpret that as applying today. But, I think everybody should agree that when we begin implementing things politically, and therefore the, the ruler therefore now has the sword to uphold a particular law, these laws should be made carefully so that we do not accidentally demand things from people that God himself uh, would not consider legitimate to demand. And so that we do not demand people to go against their conscience in areas in which the Lord has not commanded a positive precept. And this, of course, is a potential problem. Now, of course, there's obviously a lot of nuance to how these issues are dealt with because there's all sorts of different ways governments are structured and just because you disagree with how the government functions doesn't mean that you are legitimized in every single act of disobedience against that government. As we see in Romans 13 and uh, 1 Peter 2. So there is still something to be understood there, that there's a bit of nuance there. However, if you take laws that are ostensibly applied from a Christian perspective, then there is an extra uh, degree of necessary uh, scrutiny there because the law is not merely then being presented as something that is done for the usefulness and the function of the state and therefore the benefit of the uh, commonwealth of its citizens, but also for the uh, specific application of Christian virtues in a society. And therefore, we do not wish to misrepresent Christianity 
when we positively seek to implement Christian virtues politically. And as I have said before, I am in favor of positively implementing Christian virtues uh, as I believe that all laws have to in some way be based on particular virtues. And obviously each person will base that on, on his own religion and therefore Christians will base their virtues that they uh, utilize when making policies on their Christian virtues. So uh, that obviously makes sense. Uh, obviously there's a bit of nuance as to how far you go and how much do you demand non-Christians to work in that system. And so there's different ways that it, that applies. So you've got the pillarization model, you've got the federalism model, you've got the theonomy model. There's different models that people use to how that should function. Uh, but the, the point here is that we should not demand other Christians to do more than what God has commanded them, thereby depriving them of their Christian liberty against their consciences. So we can look at that in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for the sake that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Wherefore, therefore ye eat, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give not offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So in this case here, Paul is talking about eating meat that uh, could have been potentially sacrificed to idols. And he says that if nobody's making a big deal about it, then it's fine because there's nothing that is intrinsically uh, evil about the meat just because it has been uh, potentially sacrificed to an idol. But if somebody is making a big deal of it, then what you do is you, you, you are considerate of that opinion and you refuse to eat it because otherwise it may give people the wrong impression. But what is the point here? The, the point here, as we see is that there's nothing in inherently wrong about eating the meat uh, on its own. As uh, Paul is even saying, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? That uh, his own conscience actually is not what pushes him to behave in such a way. But rather it is the conscience of others uh, f for whose sake he is doing this because they are not as strong in the faith, or they are perhaps being uh, hypercritical. And so this brings us into, therefore, a question. And the question is, would it then be legitimate for someone to give a general command not to eat any meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Well, according to Paul here, the answer is actually no, because he says that it is okay to eat 
uh, asking no question for conscience sake. So if it's not a big deal, if nobody's talking about it, then it's fine. Because there's nothing inherently wrong with the meat. And so the real problem then is when people do make a big deal about that. So in, so therefore, when we apply various uh, precepts, when we try to apply various rules, we have to ask ourselves, why are we actually applying these rules? Are we applying these rules because somebody is doing something wrong? And of course, this is only talking about uh, the behavior of a Christian living in a, a predominantly pagan community. And as such, there are certain things going on here. And it's not really talking about it in a political sense. But if, therefore, it is not something that would uh, pressure Paul's own conscience, then would it be something that would be lawful to make a law over? And the answer to that is no. Because it is not something that actually has to do with the underlying morality of the action, but rather has to do with the way in which people interact with each other in a polite society and the way in which Paul wants to be able to communicate with others without undermining his ability to minister. As such, in this case, we end up in a situation where if somebody were to say that therefore uh, we are going to legally ban this type of thing, we end up in, a, in an instance where somebody is actually being excessive in the application of a sword, where somebody would be applying the sword in an instance when it is actually not justifiable. And this is precisely one of the complaints that people make about certain types of applications of Christian governance, that they demand things that uh, the conscience of persons themselves would not demand, and they demand them utilizing, of course, the authority that necessitates the use of the sword. And this has consequences because it means that now you are not only demanding things that are generally binding to the conscience of all men, but you're now, bi you're now binding people to things that uh, are not binding to their conscience. And perhaps, if you go far enough, may even be contrary to the conscience. And this is something similar to what the, uh, some of the Pharisees were doing as we read in the Gospels. And uh, some people like to call this legalism, where, they where people try to bind people to the law in ways that go far in excess of the purpose of the law, as well as the uh, application of proper Christian precepts, and perhaps even going so far as to applying this in a soteriological sense, which, of course, is not the focus here. Um, but my point is that you have to be very careful when you want to apply various laws relating to the Christian faith, because it's not merely something that's procedural or something that has to do with the stability of a state, but this is now something that relates to piety and relates to God himself and how God interacts with the church. And therefore, there is a much uh, higher degree of accountability. And if it is something that truly divides the church, then it is a major problem that somebody would want to apply such a thing. Now, another passage that is relevant is Galatians 2. Then, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run 
or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, for not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these, who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mightily in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only then would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For because that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, Oh, sorry, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled, dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We, who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, for the law, am dead to the law, but I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, here we have a situation here where uh, Peter and Paul are in Antioch. And Peter initially uh, is accommodating to those who are uncircumcised, to non-Jews, essentially. But then, by peer pressure of uh, when some Jews came uh, from Jerusalem, he changed the way he behaved. And because of that, it was driving a wedge in the church at Antioch between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And so here, Paul then confronts Peter. And now some people like to present this as if it was a debate between Peter and Paul um, about whether uh, the... Jews and Gentiles, how, how they should relate and, and whether the uh, uh, Gentiles ought to be circumcised. 
I don't interpret it that way because I read in uh, Acts that Peter was one of the early apostles to actually end up preaching to Gentiles as and and to uncircumcised people. So in, in that sense, I, I think that Peter's error was more so in his attitude that he took when he bowed to peer pressure and when he uh, behaved to accommodate his fellow Jews rather than an actual uh, deep theological uh, problem. Now, of course, uh, Paul then points out the inconsistency of Peter's actions. Now, of course, this, of course, has to do with the questions of the law and the gospel, faith and the law, and how that interacts. And there's a few different ways to understand how that goes about. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this is yet another instance where trying to be faithful, someone who is an actual Christian in, ins in this instance, does something that actually is somewhat harmful to the church. Now, of course, this isn't in a political sense. This is something that has more to do with behavior within the church. Uh, but, of course, this issue was resolved here, and that certainly is uh, a good thing to celebrate. Now, another one is Galatians 5, because, of, of course, the uh, issue... In, in Galatians 2 is that there was a, a liberty that people had in relation to certain precepts of the law. For example, circumcision. Another one is dietary laws, uh, regular sacrifices. Those are all things that uh, Christians are not bound to. And therefore... There is this idea that such things that had been binding previously were not binding, or perhaps a better way to say is that it does not bind those who do not enter into that covenant. So let's let's read Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now, when Paul says this, that to, to take the covenant sign of the law, which is circumcision, makes you a debtor to the whole law. Um, I, I think that this is something that... Uh, to me, indicates a somewhat uh, a concept of the indivisibility of the law, that the law isn't really something that you can divide into uh, ceremonial, moral, and civil, and, and then separate them into separate sections that have different uh, degrees of applicability. Uh, and of course, then might, people might say, well, what about the, the moral law? Does that mean that People aren't bound to morality as it is written in the law. And the answer is no, because the moral law is not merely the covenant law. It's not merely something that is contained within the uh, law of the covenant, but it's also something that exists uh, before that. That, uh, as Paul says, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So the condemnation of the law is something that... Uh, in a moral sense, pre-exists the covenant law, but actually has to do with the eternal moral law, which is represented within the Mosaic law. Uh, but it is not identical to that. So that's why people who are not part of the covenant can be bound to the morality of the covenant. But the statutes themselves are not the same. And this is what theologians mean when they 
talk about the general equity of a moral law, that there's a general applicability of some elements of the Mosaic law, especially when it relates to morals, that are universally applicable. And then, of course, there's people that take this in different directions. Uh, so the theonomists like to reinterpret that in a, in a bit of a different way than the people that develop that terminology do. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I personally disagree with theonomy, but that's not the purpose of this series. The purpose here is to talk about Christian nationalism. Uh, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty only... Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, uh, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, once again, this does not mean that we are not under moral precepts. What this means is that we are not in the covenant of the law. And therefore, that we are not uh, bound to the obedience to circumcision and to the all, all of the ritual laws and the civil applications thereof and uh, a number of other things contained in the law and that we as Christians have a a liberty as is written now once again this is not a liberty to do anything you want uh, however it is a liberty from both the penalties of the law and from many of the covenant rituals of the law. But that also does not mean that we are separated from the law either. Because, of course, we are always under the ultimate moral law of God, as well as uh, it is also written in Galatians that uh, through Christ, we as Christians are beneficiaries of these old covenants. Even if we are not... Uh, full members like Christ is, as Christ himself is fully obedient to the law, uh, to every letter of the law. And this is something that is emphasized, of course, in the gospel. So does that mean that the law is over? No, it means that we have somebody who is obedient to the law on our behalf, which is Jesus Christ. It does not mean that we ourselves are covenant members of the law as we are not by virtue of the fact that we do not as christians demand circumcision at least not for religious uh, reasons i understand in some countries uh, people do circumcision for uh, medical reasons and in some countries for cosmetic reasons but in general christians do not do circumcision for theological reasons uh, and this is precisely because of the things Paul is saying here in Galatians. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, 
of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So once again, I'm not arguing in favor of antinomianism. I'm not arguing in favor of abandoning all the morals of the law, as indeed the law is very relevant because the law instructs us, as Paul tells us, it is a schoolmaster to us. And it tells us all these different things about God's character and about these things that violate God's character. And those who continue in, in those things, those who continue in those things which are contrary to the law, those who fall under the condemnation as put forward in the law, not just merely the law of the covenant, but the uh, eternal law of God as derived from his character, do not inherit the kingdom of God. They do not enter into the heavenly kingdom. They do not, they're they not well received by Jesus Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So a uh, final uh, encouragement here to virtue that Paul gives. So what, what is the purpose then of talking about the law in, in such ways? Well, the purpose here is to say that people who demand obedience to such things and they try to make very roundabout explanations as to why Christians should do certain things and should not do certain things and then they implement the force of violence on that and they don't really have a solid uh, scriptural argument especially one that would overcome Paul's arguments that he makes in Galatians that leads to a number of problems because then it enters into areas where Christians actually have liberty and where they have a, a conscientiousness and these are issues that normally ought to be uh, as some might say, uh, adiaphora, these are minor issues that uh, can divide opinions, but that should not uh, divide the church. But then people bring these issues up and, and they make them bigger, and that can cause problems. So I'm going to look at another passage, 1 Peter 2, 15 through 17. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as of the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So once again here, there is a, a liberty here that Christians have. And in this case, there is also a possible abuse of a liberty, and that is a cloak of maliciousness. So... For one, we should not simply be uh, libertines, that is, people who uh, do anything and they consider anything valid as, as long as they uh, are able to do it. That's obviously wrong. Obviously, Christians should have a life of faithfulness and repentance and should seek to be sanctified and be made more righteous. And therefore, they should be doing things that are contrary uh, to those evil things that God has condemned. But also, there's a possibility that Christians will say, well, by my liberty, I can actually implement stronger and stringent measures. So, when you talk about Christian nationalism, by your liberty, you might think, well, it's okay to be a Christian nationalist. I'm going to promote Christian nationalism. I'm going to get the state to be a state that affirms Christian nationalism. And then through what you perceive to be a, uh, a valid form of government, you could ultimately end up harming other Christians. And that is something that I will be getting into next 
So the harm to other Christians that uh, could have come from Christian nationalism. This is particularly relevant to Christian nationalism, for even if one disagrees with all of the other criticisms made against it in this work, so all the other things I've said in the previous episodes, if you disagree with all of them, the implementation of the system and the giving of the sword to its masters would be a cause for fear among many Christians, who worry that the manifestation of its controversies will lead to the performance of injustices that defame the faith and lead to the sword being used against those Christians who refuse to obey commands that both violate their consciences and have no legitimacy derived from that which guides the true faith. So, there is a, a real cause for concern among Christians that if you, as a Christian, have objections to Christian nationalism, and there are many Christians that do have objections to Christian nationalism, and beyond that, even if you are someone who does not have objections, theological objections to Christian nationalism, you have to acknowledge that these people exist. And the people that do have objections have, of course, the fear that it will defame the Christian faith due to a misapplication of Christian principles. As mentioned before, through things like popular sovereignty, uh, through things like identitarianism, uh, through other... Uh, problematic uh, ways to view government and to view the relationship of the Christian church to the government and to society at large. For example, the mixing of the sacred and the common or even the sacred and the profane, the confusion of those who are aligned with Satan to those who are aligned with Christ. All those things are objections that people have. And I'm certain there's other uh, objections that people have, perhaps coming from a more liberal perspective, although those are things that I don't really uh, get into or necessarily agree with uh, in every case. There are some things that I might agree with, but of course it depends on the argument being made. And not only that, but if you are in charge of a government, you have to, of course, issue orders. So somebody has to carry out those orders out. And let's say you have... A, uh, a conscription system, which you might say, well, not every country has a conscription system for its military or needs a conscription system for its military. Well, if you're in trouble in a war, you might eventually need to have a conscription system because that's just how things end up working. So then people are recruited into the military and they have to obey the orders of the government. So what if there is a Christian nationalist government that issues an order relating to enforcing a particular precept of Christian nationalism that is then objectionable to a Christian who is uh, in that military now. Well, then you have a situation in which the conscience of that person goes against what the government is saying, and as such, the person will have to object. And... As militaries go, uh, people who object, uh, you, since you can't have everybody object, uh, eventually there needs to be a line where a push comes to shove and you have to punish somebody. Because that's that's just how it works. Otherwise, everybody could object and, and everybody could object without consequences. Then there's problems. Now, of course, I understand that in... Uh, a lot of countries, there are such things as conscientious objectors and that in many cases they are not punished in any way. However, that is because they are uh, likely small in number and therefore they are not indispensable to the function of the military. Now, of course, uh, there are instances where countries have punished conscientious objectors. Um, uh, for example, Germany in World War II I believe, was punishing conscientious objectors. Um, and there's other instances uh, from perhaps less authoritarian states also doing such things. Uh, that's just one that came to mind because that's something that's uh, specifically known here. And then you have to ask, 
is this something that is sufficiently important that we should be bringing this against the conscience of the person? And I'm not just saying this specifically about Christian nationalism. This is true about any other political ideology. Are you willing to kill people over this? Are you willing to imprison people over this? Are you willing to fine people over this? And that is a serious problem. Now, therefore, you have to ask yourselves, well, what do we actually base these things on? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 4.2 once again. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So, here we have it. Don't change the law that God has given. Uh, obviously, that, that's one thing. So, uh, as I have mentioned before, I don't think Christian nationalism is something that is mandated in the Old Testament law. So, if you're a theonomist, I don't think Christian nationalism is the way to go. At least not if you want to make a solid uh, phenomical argument. I don't think that there is a, a solid phenomical argument for Christian nationalism. Uh, or even from other perspectives either, uh, which is, of course, why I wrote this book. Because I, I don't think there's any uh, solid, scripturally sound argument for Christian nationalism. There are some uh, semi-sound arguments, but of course, I would say that they are refuted by other elements of scripture, which I do bring forward uh, in this series. Anyway, another passage, 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 16. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So once again, if you want to do something on behalf of the faith, you need to study it properly and avoid things and, and avoid including these things, especially in your arguments. If you're going to talk about a uh, Christian political theory, things that actually increase ungodliness. Another passage is second uh, Timothy three, 14 for 17. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation for faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So once again here, Timothy is being told, that he has been taught various things, and not only has he been taught things in person, but he also has a standard uh, inspired by God himself, which is the Holy Scriptures. And this is useful for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And, the, and all this helps to enhance the man of God and make him perfect and fairly furnished unto all good works. And of course, all good works would uh, include how to properly interact with the government. So you have to be able to make that solid, hard argument, not a soft argument, not an argument saying, well, nations exist in scripture and God has established nations and uh, people are sometimes talked about collectively and uh, we need to obey the law of God. So we're going to all mix that all together that we need to have a people group that is the nation and that needs to be the state and it needs to operate all under Christian precepts and then everybody is together like that. That's that's a very there are people that make arguments exactly like that and it's very vague. It it doesn't go deep enough. There are plenty of messages, as I have mentioned before, uh, in scripture uh, relating to nations that refute that understanding of nationhood, that understanding of nation states. As I talked about in, I, I believe it was uh, the uh, episode 
four, perhaps, when I talk about these things. So all of this goes to say that you need a real solid argument, and it needs to be an argument that is not merely based on an opinion, but it has to be based on the word of God, because this is something that you ultimately are going to have to kill over if you want to implement it. Uh, even if you have a peaceful plan for implementing the system, the fact remains that all systems uh, politically ultimately have to be able to resort to violence in order to maintain themselves if they do not want to be destroyed. And, and that is why they have been given a sword by God. God has given them a sword, as we read in Romans 13, and they have the ability to use it so that they can actually maintain the system of justice and actually are able to reward good and punish evil as God has instructed them. Because while they might be able to do those things sometimes without resorting to the sword, and in times of prosperity and peace, that is very good to have, there are times in which push comes to shove and you actually have to en engage in violence in order to actually accomplish that duty which God has given to the state. And that is when you have to ask yourself, was it really worth it to want to kill over such issues? Is it worth it to command other faithful Christians to kill over these issues? Is it worth it to go against the conscience of faithful Christians and punish them for disobedience uh, when they refuse to obey commands relating to this? And that is all something that is extremely relevant to that discussion. Therefore, it is better to live in peace with each other wherever possible as God has commanded. So, that Christians are not moved to kill each other over matters like Christian nationalism toward which the Lord has not given positive assent. So, let, let's talk about peace uh, a bit. Uh, Mark 9.50 Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. So here, Christians ought to be peaceful with each other, and to have that saltiness, and, and that's something that I'm not going to get into, but it is something that a lot of people uh, have preached about quite a bit, so I'm certain that you can find a lot of uh, sermons about salt. Romans 12, 17 for 21. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he first give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So here once again, we have a situation where you should not be overly wrathful, even against people who are unfaithful. Because ultimately, God is the one that has vengeance. So it is not necessary to right all wrongs in this world. It is not necessary to uh, put the law to every single thing that you consider that it might need. Now, of course, there's a lot of nuance, of course. There are things that we do need to positively implement in the law. We do need to, at the very least, be able to maintain the peace of society. And, uh, how, however, if we are going to a point of disagreement like Christian nationalism, I think it is better to have peace among Christians than to try to implement this, which will necessarily cause conflict among Christians. And, of course, not to mention uh, potentially other conflicts uh, as well. 
And does and that does not mean that I think that politicians should have a neutral attitude, a theologically neutral, a religiously neutral attitude. That is entirely not my position. I know that that is a position that a lot of liberals take, but I'm not a liberal, so I don't take that position. Uh, however, I think ideally you would want a government that allows Christians to function both when they are in the majority and when they are in the minority, when they are popular and when they are unpopular. And a type of... Uh, not necessarily religious uniformity, because obviously Christian nationalism is different from sacralism, although it sometimes may, in some formulations, have religious uniformity. Uh, but an excessively aggressive, you could say, uh, implementation of these principles will eventually lead to a situation where those same institutions may be used against faithful Christians as we see uh, potentially happening not just from non-Christians uh, or uh, visibly non-Christian people, but also from uh, fake Christians, false brothers infiltrating and taking over institutions. And therefore, uh, due to the falseness of their faith, they do not have the same theological rigor as true Christians which leads them to perhaps fall into heresies and then through the outpouring of their uh, own uh, religious virtues into the political sphere, they will then promote heresies and through the strength of the institution of Christian nationalism, they will pervert the faith and pervert the integrity of the church uh, not in, in the invisible sense, but at least in an outward institutional sense and in a legal sense, and therefore undermine the faith. And that is a problem that I think is indeed possible and something that I think not only is something that is possible, but something that uh, has happened internally in some uh Christian denominations um, where they take a perhaps excessively progressive stance and then people who are more interested in, and are more in love with these progressive principles than they are in love with Christ end up rising the ranks in such organizations and ultimately they take over and they hollow out what was once a community that uh, at least ostensibly had a lot of uh, outwardly professed faith and make it into something that outwardly professes uh, things that are abominable. And so I see a real risk of this happening in not just in a religious institution, but also in a political institution. And as such, I think that it is better, in my opinion, to develop a system that prevents persecution in general rather than one that uh, tries to look into it in particular uh, because of the potential abuses that can occur. And, and that's just my opinion. I know that there's other ways that people like to structure uh, these systems. Now, another passage we can look at is Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in the word or deed, 
do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So, once again, long-suffering, humbleness, meekness. Uh, of course, people like to say meekness is not weakness. Uh, but there is a peace that we should have as Christians with one another. And, of course, with the broader society re uh, representing the peace that Christ has. Uh, and, and that is something that is important, I believe. And something that I, I believe would perhaps be undermined by an excessively ambitious system like Christian nationalism that necessarily goes against things that are against my conscience and against the conscience of many other Christians. First uh, Thessalonians five twelve through fifteen. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. So once again, there, there's the idea here that you should not do evil for evil. You should not uh, be so wrathful there in that way. Of course, there, there's a, a righteous wrath, but ultimately, in, in many cases, it is not necessary for us to be wrathful. Because ultimately, God is our avenger. God will have justice for us on our behalf. Another passage, Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Look, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So once again, peace with all men is important. This does not mean that you abandon all sense of justice. But this means that you are very careful about what things you actually are willing to kill over. Okay. Because if you kill people for a frivolous reason, then you have you do not have peace. You are not making peace. You are actually causing war, not just against men, but also against God's justice. And that is entirely my assertion that uh, Christian nationalism would necessarily demand the killing for a an unjustifiable reason, which, in my opinion, is a serious problem. So, that is why Christians should not be moved to kill each other over matters like Christian nationalism, toward which the Lord has not given positive assent. What does that mean? God has not positively supported Christian nationalism in Scripture. And it's extremely hard for someone to demonstrate that he has, or not just scripture, but uh, church tradition, if you take that route. Even in that case, good luck trying to find uh, all the patristics and, and all the medieval theologians to, and, and even modern theologians, there's many that you won't find are actually supporting this. But uh, there you go. That is a serious assertion on this matter. In conclusion, seeing that the Lord does not approve of misuses of a sword and that Christian nationalism properly defined violates several theological precepts of the Christian faith, it is good to offer a brotherly warning to those Christians who are assessing whether they should become Christian nationalists. Indeed, for this reason and those mentioned in the preceding chapters of my book, Christians 
should oppose Christian nationalism. Those who are unsure, confused, or ignorant, they should study God's doctrines together with the church to better understand the issue at hand and come to a conclusion that conforms to God's revelation. So, if you don't know, if after everything I've said, you still are on the fence, study, okay? Don't just study by yourself. Get others to study with you. It's two heads are better than one. And what should you be studying? Study what I've been studying, scripture. And uh, that will tell you a lot about what God wants and what God does not want. Those who have objections to the definitions and conclusions of this work, let them bring forward their arguments and correct any errors so that the faith is edified by honest and dignified discussions of the truth. And th that is something I also want to uh, address here, that I don't think I'm perfect. Have I made a mistake somewhere? Perhaps. I don't think I have. Otherwise, I would not have published my book if I thought that I had made a, a mistake in my argumentation somewhere. But I'm certain that there are people that perceive that I have made a mistake. Perhaps not just in the conclusions of my work, of, of a book that I've written, uh, but they also might think that perhaps they don't like the definition I give to Christian nationalism. Perhaps they don't like the definition I give to the Christian nation. Perhaps they don't like many things that I've said. But if, if people honestly disagree, I think it's good to be able to communicate because by this communication, we can enhance our understanding. I can enhance my understanding and others can, under can enhance their understanding. And that is really one of the primary purposes here that we can edify the church through honest and dignified discussion of the truth. Furthermore, those who continue to falsely claim to be Christian nationalists after coming to understand its proper definition, they should cease because they defame themselves and their true ideologies by doing so. So if you're, you call yourself a Christian nationalist, but you don't believe in popular sovereignty, in identitarianism, in the uh, fusion of nation and state, in uh, various other things that I've talked about, just don't call yourself a Christian nationalist. Because my definitions are not merely based on my opinion. They are based on looking at how other people term nationalism. So if you don't like my definitions, sure, you, you are free to disagree with me. But ultimately, if I am correct in my definitions, then you should not be calling yourself a Christian nationalist. You should be calling yourself something else. Perhaps you're a theonomist. Perhaps you're a sacralist. Perhaps you're uh, a Christian federalist, which is different from Christian nationalism. Then do that. And by doing that, we will be able to be better equipped to communicate your points and your actual position. Because if you call yourself a Christian nationalist without being one, then all the criticisms that people direct against Christian nationalism, against the real Christian nationalism, will also be directed against your ideology uh, by proxy, even if they are not actually applicable to your ideology. And also that means that you defame yourself because you are either ignorant or negligent or perhaps malicious in calling yourself something that you are not. And that, of course, is another problem. But those who commit grievous sins in the name of Christian nationalism and contrary to the love of the Lord, after coming to know the truth and being subject to proper procedures, do not repent of being deceivers, idolaters, rebels, traitors, defilers, blasphemers, usurpers, murderers, tyrants, or whatever else. Are they not anathema? So, if you, in the name of Christian nationalism, commit various sins uh, and you do not repent, then are you not anathema? So this is an argument that I'm going to go through here. So let's first look at John 14. Verse 
Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to place, uh, sorry, to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. But whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not seen me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am the Father and the Father, uh, that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. If you love Jesus Christ, keep his commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but he, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, and ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. So here is the love of Jesus Christ, that being in him, and him in us, and the Father it, together as well, and the Holy Spirit, this uh, togetherness that we have, that is all rooted in the love, the love of the Lord. And, of course, that love is reciprocated by us, not just us towards the Lord, but also us towards each other. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. So, yeah, it's a common name. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come unto him, and make our abode, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And, how, and now I have told you before, it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, 
let us go hence. So once again, the love, the peace, and all of that, if you love God, you are also being drawn to the Lord and you are uh, being conformed to the image of a son and you are also going to, uh, as a result of all of this, become more sanctified and enter into a greater obedience to him. And and that is something that is very clearly emphasized in this passage, the connection between love and obedience with the relationship of God. So then, therefore, those who commit sins in the name of Christian nationalism are working contrary to the love of the Lord. Now, there are some things that you can do if somebody in your church is living contrarily to that love and is committing grievous sins. Well, we see this in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. So let me just get there real quick. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So here, there's a process for dealing with uh, people who are uh, sinning uh, within the church. And first is, is to privately confront. And, and of course, there's the, the question of repentance there. Then you go further and you take multiple witnesses to uh, demonstrate the case. But then if that is ignored, you talk to the whole church. And if the person still refuses to repent, then what you do is that person is then excluded from the faith community. That person is excluded from the assembly. That person becomes a heathen man and a publican, somebody who is not considered to be a faithful person. And one of the reasons for this is, of course, because you want that person to repent. And if they truly are faithful, then they love the church and they love Jesus Christ and they will be uh, greatly moved to repentance because of that separation. But another reason is that if that person truly is someone who is unrepentant, then that demonstrates that that person possibly is someone who does not love Jesus Christ, someone who does not love the church, and therefore someone who does not belong in the church. So that is uh, a, a serious issue. Now, another passage is, I believe, 1 Corinthians 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So, in this case, there is a, a particular case happening in the church of Corinth where someone is uh, having a potentially sexual relationship with his uh, stepmother, presumably. Uh, hopefully not biological mother, uh, although most people would say that this is the uh, stepmother. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that have done this deed. In the name of our Lord 
Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such as one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Our glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetants, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So this is uh, one of the ways that excommunication is applied, not just merely in the sense of not associating with someone, but uh, in many cases refusing access to uh, what uh, people variously call the Lord's Supper or Communion or Eucharist. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So, God's judgment is therefore given a particular jurisdiction here. Now, of course, God judges everyone. But he's saying that in the context of the church, God is the one that is relied upon to judge those outside of the church. And within the church, there is a degree of jurisdiction and judgment. But those who are outside of the church, those who uh, do not belong to the church because they are people that continue in all these different sins without uh, repenting, those are to be put out. Those are to, to be separated from the assembly. And, of course, there's a few different ways that different denominations apply this. And I think one problem is when people uh, try to perhaps not apply it at all when it should be. And another problem is when people take it to weird degrees like stalking and, and doing things like that. That's obviously wrong. I've heard that there's people that exercise church discipline in that way where uh, when somebody then leaves the church, uh, obviously because that person is not going to repent of his sins, then they stalk the person and they try to treat that person as if that person is still somebody who they have jurisdiction to judge over even though that person has left and therefore... Uh, having left of his own volition, is someone who clearly does not love the uh, assembly of believers enough to be enjoined with them. Now, of course, there's also the problem of people that try to apply this on excessive matters, uh, matters in which uh, that, that go against Christian liberty and, and things like that. Uh, things that people do that some people consider to be sinful. For example, teetotalers, may perhaps try to uh, exercise church discipline on somebody who drinks alcohol, even though it's, it's not a sin to drink alcohol. Uh, I know that that's controversial in some circles, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is, guys, okay? Uh, but nevertheless, the point is that they should be separated if they do not repent. Now, of course, the hope is that they do repent. The hope is that even if it causes them anguish to be separated in such a way that their spirit is saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. But if they don't repent, then it shows that, as as it says, they, uh, they, they came out from us, but they were never of us. Uh, 
So yeah. So so that those are the proper procedures. And I understand people like to apply them differently, but after coming to know the truth, so if if you find somebody who's a Christian nationalist, not on the basis of them being a Christian nationalist, but on the basis of particular sins that they are committing in the name of Christian nationalism, uh and, and and which are contrary to the love of the Lord. So once again, I'm not condemning Christian nationalists specifically here. I'm not saying that by virtue of just being called a Christian nationalist that somebody uh, goes under church discipline. I'm saying that if they commit sins in the name of Christian nationalism uh, and, and do various things, for example, rebellion, that's, a, that, that's something that's a, a problem. People that uh, assassinate a political leader uh, that might be a, a sin that somebody might commit. Uh, even though, uh, in that case, typically, uh, if, if a person is caught, the uh, political leaders will likely uh, be mainly dealing with that rather than church discipline. But it still is something that, if, if somebody is part of that church, that has to do with them. And it's not something that people should just simply abdicate uh, their responsibility of because obviously somebody commits a sin we want that person to repent and so it's not something that you just cut off communication with somebody that commits some grievous sin you actually have to seek out and communicate uh, and and see if you can resolve the issue but so what are what are these things that people could be accused of well being deceivers idolaters so Deceivers, people that lie about Christian nationalism or, or, or lie about various related issues. Idolaters, people that um, are perhaps so obsessed with nationalism that they undermine the Christian element uh, and therefore become idolatrous to that. Rebels, as I mentioned before. Traitors, people that betray uh, in the name of Christian nationalism. Defilers, blasphemers. People that blaspheme in the name of Christian nationalism, uh, it, and, and this would be, uh, I, I already make a slight accusation of, of potential blasphemy, though it's not a hard accusation because I don't know it, what's happening in people's minds. I, I wouldn't say that somebody is actively blaspheming unless I know what's, uh, unless it's extremely clear, but the confusion of servants of Satan with servants of God is obviously something that I consider to be problematic in that sense. That doesn't mean that that person is automatically a blasphemer, but it means that there is an inconsistency. So, so when somebody then says, uh, wants to actively say that those people are indeed, that, that people who are servants of Satan can indeed be considered Christian, that is going beyond the pale for me. Although, of course, I don't know if I would go that far. But usurpers, people that overthrow governments, murderers, tyrants, and whatever else. Are they not anathema? So on, on what basis am I saying that people that commit all these various sins are anathema? Well, we see, uh, or accursed, as people might translate. 1 Corinthians 16.22 If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. So, if you do those things which are contrary to the love of the Lord, and you do not repent of them, then you are anathema. Because you demonstrate by your works that you are working contrary to the love of Jesus Christ. And I think that that's a, a very serious thing to consider. I'm not saying that every Christian nationalist is anathema. I'm not pronouncing an anathema. All I'm saying is that people who sin and do not repent are anathema, according to scripture. So th th these are people that are cursed. And I hope that that should uh, give a very strong thought to people who are seriously considering Christian nationalism. Is this thing right? Is it proper? Is it something that is in obedience to what the Lord demands? And if it is, 
then it's good. But if it isn't, then you have a serious problem. So anyway, that's where I'll stop today. I've gone through all of the material relating to what's written in my book. Um, I'm not going to go straight to the uh, question and answer segment because obviously my show is pretty small, so I don't have a lot of engagement. I want to give people time to catch up. So, uh, and, and of course, a lot of these episodes are pre-recorded and they come out days or some, in some cases even a week after they're recorded because of how I schedule uh, my uploads. So in, in that sense, there is going to be some time in between that. So I'm going to uh, do an, a couple of other things after this. I'm going to do a summary of the points that I put in my book. So a, sort of a short recap, you could say. And I'm also going to talk about some of the statistics as to uh, what's kinds of scripture and how much of it I have cited in my book, which I think is something interesting on a different angle there, just something perhaps a bit more uh, lighthearted to talk about. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and I hope that at this point it should be very clear to you, uh, at least my opinion, why Christians should oppose Christian nationalism. If you disagree, once again, feel free to read my book in the description below and to also consult that alongside scripture and with fellow believers to really examine these issues. Because as I said, since this is a matter of the sword, government is something that eventually requires the sword. It is a matter of life and death. People can indeed get killed or kill on behalf of this ideology as with any other ideology. So, even if you are interested in Christian nationalism, I recommend that you are very careful and carefully divide the truth from errors so that you have a clear understanding of what God actually allows and what he does not allow. So anyway, thank you all for watching. I've been C.A. Brill, and I hope that the love and the grace and the peace of our Lord is with you. And I will be seeing you all next time. Over and out.